Happy Tuesday. Welcome to our uh, special board meeting to talk about historic preservation. It's a subject that's been kind of floating in and around for several years right now, and we're trying to kind of work through the process. The meeting tonight will be really focused on really getting the board to come to a consensus in terms of what we want. We want you guys to listen and hear. There will be chance for comment, but I don't, you know, depending on how that goes, and up to uh, Lydia in terms of we want to enter into an exchange of dialogue, right? So it's your call. Oh, so thanks. Well, I know I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, it's your call. All right. So I a lot of interested party here, and I love it. This is a good topic to talk about. Historic preservation is something near and dear to the village of Rybeck. Uh, it's part of what defines who we are, what we are and how we function a lot in the, in, the, in the village. So the historic character of the village is crucial to discuss. It's crucial to have this open dialogue about what we're kind of trying to do. Uh, so I appreciate you all being here. And we're gonna kick it off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> okay. Um, currently, Trustee Slade Slaby has been taking the lead on this and trying to put words around it, bring it into focus for us. There's a couple key things that we want to focus on tonight, and one of the key things is setting a date for what we need to, whether it's X, Y, or Z, and Lydia will bring us up on that, and then we'll also try to talk about the boundaries and how those boundaries exist today, not only how they're defined within the village, but how the state and the federal government define them, and how we should go forward. Is that ample enough for you that to turn off? sounds great, thank you. Um, so to bring everybody up to speed, because it's been a minute since we talked about this uh, fulsomely in a public forum, um, the village of Rhinebeck has a long history with our historic district. Um, it was first uh, created and listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. Um, we uh, updated our code in 2009 um, to capture it, specifically in two different ways. Um, chapter 64, which is not in our zoning code, our zoning code is chapter 120, chapter 64 guides the process around demolishing what's considered a contributing historic structure. Um, and that definition currently is um, buildings inside the historic district uh, that are um, built on or prior to 1930 and listed, within, and listed as contributing on the district. There's a secondary definition to it, which is what we're running into at the moment, which basically says that any building listed as contributing in any federally or state designated district is also considered contributing. So <clears throat> when we expanded, when we applied to the state, and then the state um, granted that application and then submitted to the federal government, um, we expanded the boundaries of the district and we also expanded what is considered contributing. Um, and the survey basically took all of the buildings um, with very little discretion that were built prior to 1970 and made those contributing. So at the moment our laws, um, our chapter 64 is in conflict with itself basically. Um, and then there's the question of 120-39 which is our historic district overlay. And that is um, the boundaries of our historic districts, our, our historic district overlay, that allows the planning board to have increased scrutiny over um, major construction inside the historic district, whether or not it's on a contributing building, um, in order to give the overall neighborhood the look and feel that the overall neighborhood is. That was a terrible sentence. But the idea behind that is to make sure that the neighborhood retains the character of the neighborhood, even if new construction comes in. Um, so as I mentioned in the email that was sent out, 
job. <clears throat> Chapter 64 is a much more granular operation. Is this specific building something that we worry about losing or losing bits and pieces of? Is this specific building really important to the history of Rhinebeck and the history of the district and the fabric of the district? Um, and then 12039 is more forest, less tree, and does this overall neighborhood look and feel the way we want it to look and feel according to the historic district? Um, so <clears throat> that's how I like to think about it. That's how our lawyer has trained me to think about it. That's also how Shippo has trained me to think about it. Um, and so what we have is we have over here on the big screen, um, we have the 1979 district on the left, and then we have the boundary increase on the right. Um, and uh, I asked, and four of our um, residents really stood up and did an amazing job. Um, Marty Rosenblum, John Clark, Chris, Christopher Tavener, and Warren Temple Smith all got together, who are all experts in the field. They're all either architects or planners, or architects or planners, um, in with a great depth of knowledge of historic preservation. And I basically asked them, what would you do in this situation? Um, they came back with a recommendation to not go with the 1970 date, but to instead to go with 1945 because architecture changed dramatically post-war. Um, the quality of construction changed dramatically post-war. Um, and much of what we consider to be the Rhinebeck Historic District isn't what we would consider to be 1960 split levels. So um, there's an aspect of the date. Uh, they also made um, a compelling argument, um, but one that is a little bit more difficult for me personally to deal with um, about not choosing either the 1979 map or the 2020 map. Um, so neither map that's on the state or the federal register, um, but to basically create our own, which we're totally allowed to do. Um, but my concern with that is it invites a lot of confusion on the parts of property owners who are in one but not in the other. Um, so that's the summary. So I just wanted to thank those four folks. Um, three of them are here, so thank you. Um, I also wanted to thank David Miller and Jeff Christensen and Joanne, I thought I saw Jeff come in, um, and Joanne Galvin and Karen, um, whose name I'm not remembering, last name I'm not remembering at the moment, um, who also helped me think, and Mike Fraser, who also helped me think this through about a year ago as well. Um, and basically every time I get a group of people together, uh, it's very rare for them to come to consensus. And so at the end of the day, it's a little like, what do we want to do? Um, so here's the big question. Here's the big question. Do you want me to give my? So we just vote now. Or right, know, right. <laughs> oh, so this this process is um, so just so you that that's actually a good point. Um, so if we can come to some kind of consensus, then um, I can work with our lawyers and Brant to draft up the new legislation. And what we can do is we can have um, the first step on, on May 11th of um, putting forth a resolution, proposing the legislation. Um, setting a public hearing date, um, we can take comment at that time, um, and then we have to wait a month to send it up to um, Dutchess County Planning, um, and then ideally we could vote on a final decision um, in June, which would um, solve a couple of headaches that the planning board is currently facing, um, potentially facing. They're not active applicants, but they were just conversations. Um, so that's that's. That's the process. So let's talk about the, let's talk about the date. Let's just keep it. Right yeah, we now. can keep it simple. So forest. So it's tree, not forest. Days. Yeah, tree, not forest. Right. Because I think that's significant. I'll be honest with you. I was when originally we were starting to do this. I'm thinking, wow, to create something of the magnitude of 1970 and back would be pretty significant in terms of making a village of Rhinebeck probably one of the largest historic districts within the, within the state. Um, oh, it, it is. I mean, like, yeah. it, 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 it already is. Yeah. It already yeah. is. So, yeah, so none, of the, none, yeah, none of this would change the state right. or the federal stuff. This would just figure out how we're going to handle it amongst ourselves. Right. But when you think about 
that architecture as you brought up, right. I'm not so enthralled with some of the architecture that came late in that era <coughs> as being, quote, representative of the village of Rhinebeck. Um, we're not the Hamptons or whatever where everybody's cookie cutter or Charleston, which I go to a lot and everything's laid out pretty significant and everything's preserved and everything looks pretty cool, but Rhinebeck has its own unique footprint. And I actually flip-flopped and said, I don't know if 1970 is the right date. Um, so I started backing that down in terms of trying to figure out what the date is. I've listened to people who say, well, post-1945, or, you know, the 1945 era is really a significant thing. I heard 1960 at one time. So I'm, yeah. I'll, I'm telling you right now, I'm backing off of 1970. <coughs> I think that's fair. Um, I think it's also important to note that we don't have any buildings built after 1945 that are, you know, truly masterful examples of a post-1945 architectural <laughs> style. Um, you know, it's not like we have the FBI building or, um, you know, anything sort of or like that. Or Mies Van Roo or, or Mies, yeah, it's like, <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, it's like we're not D.C. and Chicago. <clears throat> Instead, we have, you know, lovely, but fairly generic, um, you know, suburban style housing from that era. Um, and not a single one of them is particularly flawless in its style. Um, Although we do have a couple Sears homes. We do have a couple Sears homes. Um, one of them is actually in, in the historic district. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is actually on the south side, which is like not part of this conversation at all, which is kind of a bummer. Um, and uh, so, yeah. But Sears homes are really nice. But I don't know if that qualifies them because there's things were bought out of a catalog to be of a historic. I mean, they could always go for being individually listed. There aren't that many actually Sears homes that are somewhat untouched left in the country, which is kind of a bummer. Um, that brings up an interesting point is, can we individually list buildings? A property owner can always go to the state and the federal government and ask to be individually listed. Um, we actually have three of those properties right now. Um, they're all part of the reason for expanding the district was to actually to capture all of them inside the district. Um, one of them is the Astor Home. Um, one of them is the Del Meter House, which is the other part of the Beekman Arms. Um, and the third is the post office. So part of the reason why they expanded it in that C area um, was to make the Astor Home contiguous with the historic district. So, um, but you know, all three of those are phenomenal examples of pre-1945 architecture. Mm -hmm. We have some great, you know, gas stations post-1945. We do. Mm -hmm. They've been converted into restaurants. Right. Um, so I'm I'm comfortable with 1945. Um, I think it's sort of the the other thing about 1945 that we sort of ran in, ran into fairly quickly is. Um, Ideally, and hopefully this will come out of the work that the Comprehensive Plan Committee is doing, and once we begin the zoning code updates that involve that, and we'll have some money for it, but um, having a huge number of architectural styles uh, requires a pattern book. Um, and to be blunt, we don't have the finances to put together a good pattern book right now. Um, and so keeping, keeping the styles um, keeping the sort of focus a little bit narrower um, helps us with that as well. Um, do any, Warren, John, Christopher, do any of you want to speak to this at all? No? Okay. You could? Do you want to jump? I know you could. <laughs> <laughs> do we want to? Um, would it be helpful for Vanessa, you or Brant to hear, or, or Barry to hear? I mean, I've spoken to John a lot about all of this. Um, well, no, I understand the 1945 reasoning. Okay. I do. I, I'm on board with it as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I took notes on all the contributing buildings. I wrote down a description, and they were, you know, the Cape Cods and the oodles of Cape Cods, the Greek revivals and there was nothing super original in that era and I said to you like I thought 1950 might be good but 
These are people with more experience than, what's that? 45 there. Yeah. yeah, well, they're the experts, so. Yeah. I mean, but that was my sense anyway, that, you know. Right, yeah. As far as, expand, as, far as expanding the district. Well, let's, can, let's stick to the district. Okay, all right, let's stick to, no, that's let's right. Stick to that, the first. We were talking about the age of significance right now. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. So we're all, we're all, we're all yeah, in I mean, consensus. Yeah, I mean, and mostly because I don't feel like there's any building built post-1945 that we have in the district, expanded or otherwise, that we would all be really upset about losing. Right. Like, that's that's the point of the 1945 cutoff yeah. date is, you know, is there anything in there that we would be really upset about losing? And I I can't think of anything. I mean, despite the fact that I built a Braves Ranch in 1970, I don't care. I didn't you can like let it go. I didn't, I didn't like it. Once I moved in, I decided, boy, did I screw up. But. Well, the other thing, too, that I think is important for all of us to remember is that historic significance is very different from aesthetic preference. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, in general, a lot of people agree that the architectural styles from the 50s, 60s, and 70s were like not, 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 not the most aesthetically pleasing. Um, and so then the trick is, do we have anything of true historic significance? And it, the answer to that is no. Yeah, well, and the other, the other point is we've kind of moved on. If you think about Platte Avenue as an example, there's been a lot of good, the house at the end of the street on Platte Avenue was finally getting redone and finished. Yeah. The house across the street has been redone. The houses down the street have been redone. We've missed a significant point. If, we, if you were going to say you were going to capture that, we should have tried it years ago before all of these homes were remodeled. Right. And, but they've been remodeled in a very nice way that is still fitting within the village of Rhinebeck. They still fit within the neighborhood. Um, so Well, and a couple of them came to the planning board just to say, hey, we know that you don't have authority over us, but this is what we're planning on doing. You know, are you comfortable with this? And the planning board generally said, you're right, we don't have authority over what you're doing, but we're just, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but like generally the designs look great, you know, go do your thing. Um, so I do, a, I do have a question though, about, I want to interrupt you a second, yeah. sorry, about Oak Street. Yes. Anything, because Oak Street is one part of the expansion, is there anything on Oak Street that, now that we've all gone through the history of Oak Street, that we want to kind of, that we want to make an exception for? Because it represents... Well, all of those are pre-1945. They're all pre-1945? Yeah. They're all pre-1945. Okay. Um, I mean, there might be, you know, some people have done a significant amount yes. of work to them that might have made them not contributing, you know, like... Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the main one there is the schoolhouse, the first yep. schoolhouse, um, which is in the same style that I'm not going to remember as the Delmeter house. Um, well, I'm bringing this up just for everybody. Yeah, so. The fact that yeah. so, you know, Oak Street has a significant history. Yeah, and Oak Street really should have been captured in the 1979 map. Um, for a variety of reasons, it was not. Um, and so, in some respects, I think the push, not in some respects, the push behind the expansion was to capture Oak Street. Um, the the schoolhouse changed hands. Everybody got concerned that it was going to be, you know, ruined. Um, that was not the case. But um, so yeah, Oak, Oak Street in its entirety is is part of the whole thing. Um, and then what they did is they captured Platt, which, as we know, the first half of Platt, um, the half of Platt that's closest to nine. Um, is very much part of sort of the architectural style of the what we would consider to be the traditional Rhinebeck historic district. Um, the second half of Platte Avenue, between Mulberry and halfway down, um, is all post-war housing. Um, and so this was the recommendation actually that um, the team of the team of gentlemen made was to actually only capture a certain part of Platte Street, Platte Avenue, not the whole. Um, you know that we can talk about in a minute, but um, most of that, most of that, most of that avenue was post 1945. All on very large pieces of property, however, so lots of small buildings on so, large pieces. So of in terms of step number one, it sounds like we're kind of in consensus here that yeah. 1945 is a is a great day. Sure. Good enough. Yeah. I mean, in the world, if we can pull any date from, you know. The eons, yeah, 1945 sounds great. And there, it's a very defensible date too, which is yes. my most. I mean, the other thing is, concern. there's some folks. I mean, we've been getting by because we're all neighbors, and 
Yeah. There's a lot of people coming in. They're just they're just going to try to make a lot of money out of a, a renovation, and they're going to be hard nosed. And if we have some kind of lofty standards, you know, we could be faced with some litigation. So the tighter we make the age of significance, the better off we may be in that regard. Yeah, um, I get that. Especially if the age of significance is defensible, you know. It, and that's why I yeah. want to get that pattern book done. And you know, we already have a reference in in the uh, chapter 120-39 yeah. for other reference materials. So we just plug that right in. Yeah. I know. It, yeah. So now that we've kind of on board, is there from our experts here? Is there any commentary that you want to make? Well, we supported the 1945 date primarily because if you read the nomination that Neil Larson did, he made a big distinction between post-war um, 1945 and forward housing, called the second half conventional suburban. Modern movement, yeah, or something. Yeah. There was no justification to pull it to 1970, and it was a 50 year arbitrary date, which the National Register criteria for evaluation doesn't supply. It says generally it generally should be over, and it's very hard to get on the National Register of 50 year. So it's sort of like the reverse. He applied the reverse standard to buildings 50 years and older rather than 50 years and modern are not eligible. So we, and what really got me involved was the fact that I was on the Comprehensive Plan Committee and they were looking at infill possibilities for housing and making buildings more historically appropriate in the village center. And we looked at the CVS and the dry cleaner and the, the, uh, the frontier building on West Chestnut. All these are now on, gonna be on, are on the National Register and would be protected against demolition. And those are the buildings we had cited for. We should, you know, those are the buildings should be demolished <laughs> and made more consistent. And so we'd be prevented from healing the wounds in the historic district. Um, so um, I think 45 is the appropriate date. You can justify it on the nomination itself. Um, and what I did, Christopher wrote up the argument and I did the map. And. Um, First of all, I want to say that that map on the left is not the 79 map. Mm -hmm. okay. That was done for the comprehensive plan in 93. I did it. <laughs> I supervised it. And it was meant to be just sort of a generic map, not showing property boundaries. So it's not accurate for what the National Register nomination is. We have versions of that if you want to use them. But that was somehow referred to in the zoning law. But it's not accurate. Here, let's try this one. Um, so what I did is I took a, a version of the map to the right, showing the existing district by parcel lines. And I added those buildings that were in the nomination that were pre-45, 45 and older. And you still get almost all of, yeah, that's the more accurate map. Um, you still get all, almost all of Oak Street. There's one top building on Oak Street, which was a reconstruction and a couple on West Chestnut, including the, the Frontier building, that would be non-contributing. Um, I put in the west end of Platt, 345 buildings on the west end of Platt, and there's some significant chunk of buildings on Mulberry and, um, and North Parsonage. Uh, North Parsonage, North Parsonage, that are from the 30s and 40s that would be added on. So you still get three new additions to the historic district, they would just be keyed to 45 and older. Um, and there would be a few buildings, more buildings that are non-contributing, like CVS and the dry cleaner and frontier building in the historic district. Um, but I think it's more defensible. And I don't see the big confusion about having two maps. One is the National Register map, one is the locally recognized historic district, which well, is- a good lead in, John, so we'll We'll kind of bridge to that back. Okay. All right. Um, um, how do you want to close out this part? Okay. So I think we're all in general agreement on 1945. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, with that being said, um, so then there's the map problem. Um, and as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, the, the boundaries are really to make sure that the neighborhood stays somewhat stylistically appropriate. 
Um, appropriate is the wrong word. Consistent. Um, you know, one example that's used a lot is there's a currently there's a vacant lot on Mulberry Street right now between um, Platte Avenue and Chestnut um, on the east side of the road, and uh, you know, there's been a lot of concern that you know some sort of glass and steel and reclaimed wood, blah, 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 is going to pop up there, which, you know, cool architecture, but not really um, in, uh, not really um, in keeping, in keep, thank you, um, in keeping with the surrounding, uh, with the surrounding block. Um, they said it would be. Well, right, yeah, but, you know, at the moment we have no way to force them to do that. Um, and. So once again, right now we're relying on the fact that people are moving to Rhinebeck or, or buying these properties because they like the look and the feel of Rhinebeck and so they're not doing a lot of um, sort of visual damage to the streetscape. Um, that being said, you know, if we want to actually keep the streetscape looking the way that it currently looks and feels, um, then the planning board needs to have authority over you know, these sort of larger swaths of land. Um, so the question that arises, that, that then arises is, um, well, if this is the map on the right, and John has just made an argument about sort of carving out chunks that are post-1945, but even then I would sort of say that, you know, Platte Avenue, the second half of that block, um, there's a lot to be said. It's sort of a charming little area. It's not, you know, none of it is particularly, you know, aesthetically overwhelming. But, you know, knocking down one of those small houses and putting up some sort of, you know, mansion that would fit on, inside 35% of what we have because of the size of the lot, um, you know, it would suddenly look very out of integrity with the block. And I think the neighbors would be really upset about that. Um, so the question arises in, you know, areas like that, you know, is this something that we want the planning board to have authority over, um, to just maintain the look and feel of the, of, of the block? Um, I would argue yes. Um, also, I have a, I don't know, maybe it's the, I don't know, the part of my personality that's a little OCD. I also have a really hard time sort of saying, here, state and federal government, can you please accept this nomination? But then when it comes to our own historic district overlay, we're going to go, oh, no, 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 not, not that one, the one that we want to do. And thank you for all of that work, but no, we want to do it differently. Um, and so there's a part of me that feels like we've been sort of di like disrespectful to the process um, and to the property owners that are sort of facing a little bit of a whiplash. Like, okay, so I'm in one historic district, but I'm not in another historic district. And what does that mean over here? And what does that mean over here? And I, and I fully appreciate John saying that it's not that complex, but um, when this is not something that you think about all the time, it can get confusing. Even people who I've explained this to multiple times still find it confusing. Um, so I do think that there's a good reason to keep um, to keep it with the state and the federal boundaries um, on multiple levels. I can put up, um, if you want to see it, the map that John created. Um, if we decided not to go with the federal map, the federal current map, I would want to make sure that at least the map that we do go with is slightly, um, isn't quite as piecemeal as, as this one that John has put a lot of effort into creating. Thank you, John. Um, because like carving out, you know, just one property or carving out a corner, you know, then it's sort of like, okay, well then this whole block looks a certain way, but then someone can build something completely different right there in that one particular lot or something. So in the same idea that um, we want to make sure that we're not protecting the CVS building, I, I think it's important to make sure that the planning board has authority over making sure that a block that is mostly in the historic district gets to sort of continue to at least to look, look, this, I am so tired tonight, I'm sorry, um, that gets to at least look, continue to look a certain way. And what's the, the downside of 
keeping the boundaries consistent with the state and national, um, is it just it's adding more? It's adding more work for the planning board. To it's, do. More, it's adding more work to the planning board. It's adding more work to property owners. Um, going in front of the planning board is not an easy process. I can speak to that personally. Um, it is lengthy. It is. Um, it can be expensive. Um, I, it has been expensive for me in time, not in dollars, because I've done most of it myself. But it can, if you don't have the time, then it gets expensive in dollars. Um, and so even if you're you're in the new expanded district. But your home was built post 1945. You still have to go to the planning board to to for it's for um, significant for, for significant expansion. Yeah. A material um, alteration. Material alteration, new construction. And then, so let me read the language actually. So, any new construction or alteration of an existing structure shall be compatible with the contributing historic property itself and surrounding historic properties in terms of height, setbacks, roof shapes, cornice features, proportions for facades, and window openings, porch details, materials, and rhythm of spacing along the street. So that can lead, like if you have a split level from 1965, it's got to be compatible with something down the block. The 1960 level. The 1930s, you know, it's got to be historic. It well, can be offensive to the historic nature of something that's half a block away. Right. I mean, I think with something like Platt, that's sort of where we run into a bit of the problems here is that although most of the, pro it's, there's a very distinct boundary line of, you know, there was that, that beautiful property from 18 something. I don't know. What's that? What's the date of that property? That's on, whatever. Um, there's that sort of, that large home that is kind of the grounding home for all of Platt Avenue. Um, but then everything to the east is all these like little split levels where the, where the greenhouses used to be. Um, so obviously the planning board wouldn't make a split level try and mimic you know, right. Victorian architecture, mm -hmm. but if somebody did come in and buy one of those properties and say they wanted to tear it down and turn it into a huge mansion or whatever, they would say, no, 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 you can't do that. It has to actually, like, you have to set it back, it has to sort of mimic height, the, the, everything. To well, setbacks are important too, because yeah. if you're allowed to be compatible with your neighbors with setbacks under this rule, and if you read the code straight out, you could go straight up to like 10, what is it, 10 feet from the front property line. And you're blocking, I mean, you've changed the nature of that entire block. Right. And I won't say whether that's happened already or not. <laughs> well, I know, it's, it's interesting actually, because I was talking to someone, someone about this, and, um, and they said, well, wait, hold on. So you mean that the planning board doesn't already have authority over like every property in the village? And I was like, no. And they were like, why not? And I was like, well, it's time to you know. And, um, and it, it was exactly that reason. It was like, well, even if I don't live on a historic block, I still don't want someone to, you know, build something that's completely out of character with the entire neighborhood. I was like, yeah, that's a fair point. Jump on that one next week. Um, you know, so this is the opportunity that we have to, to deal with that question, you know, in, in this part of the village. Um, to, to me, the only real anomaly is that one block on plan between Parsonage and Between Mulberry. Parsonage and Mulberry? Yeah. So say someone wanted to tear down one of the smaller post-1945 houses on Platt and they wanted to build something large. You yeah. know, would that have to be in keeping with that large 1800s building? No, I mean, if it's right next to that large 1800s building, then like perhaps there could be an argument made that they would work well for that one. But if it's like further up the block, then I would say no, you have to remain in integrity with you know the surrounding architecture. Compatible, is, yeah. Compatible. Yeah, which is mostly the smaller. Okay. So it's just what your neighboring ones are. It's not whatever is also the most historic, historic building yeah. on yeah, on the block. No. Even if you wanted to. Mm. Well, that's a question. <laughs> surrounding historic properties. So what, what does surrounding mean? It's whatever is reasonable. I mean, you know. That would be up to the planning board to interpret. And they have. You've probably interpreted that quite a bit. Now, we haven't run into many demolitions. Mm -mm. Right. There's only been two. Probably had probably five or six yeah. at the time I've been here. Oh, OK. Yeah. And everybody replaced it with something that was in kind. Yeah. Oh. A little brick. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
CVS was not trying to put it that way. Uh, you know, they tore down three brick storefronts and built, you know, CVS. So that was not, that, that was a disaster. I think we can all generally agree that that was a disaster. Um, so that's kind of the question. Um, would this be a good moment to open it up to public comment, or do we want to? No, I, I, okay. I'm not sure we're, we're there focused yet. on where the line should be yet. Okay. I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't see any downside with staying with what we've already defined in the state and the federal. I don't either. To keep it consistent with that plan and give the planning board the ability to, you know, make those decisions. Interpret as they will. Yeah. I know it adds more work, more houses coming in, maybe more work for other people, but well, I believe six of them are on plat are already under construction, yeah. so they're not going to be coming back. But I believe it's in the best interest of the village to have them come in front of the board, you know, to make sure that it fits within the neighborhood. So I, I would rule to keep the map because I want the planning board to have that authority. My take. Keep the new map. The one that is currently filed with the state and federal government. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's pretty, that's new. Yes. That's right. and, and for that reason, because I want the planning board to have the ability to. Yeah. Preserve the character of the neighborhood. Yep. As a whole. Yep. That's, I'm just giving you my opinion. Yeah, no, because, I agree. Yeah, I agree because the historic, historic district overlay language puts you in that realm. If you're in the historic district. Right. Yeah. yeah. Outside and of the demolition. And we can create the overlay that code. includes that yeah. district. I guess we are there. Great. Okay. okay. Yeah. Unless we hear something compelling from right. the public. So. Our experts. I lean to you guys. How far up Mulberry Street are we talking about? Well, this map, this map captures all of it. All of it? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. You all mean up by the fairgrounds? All yeah. the way up to the fence. How can you justify that? No, not including the fairgrounds. No, but all the way up to the fairgrounds. How can you justify that? Those houses are 73, 48, and 82. I, How can I, you call that a historical zone? We're saying they're within a historic zone. We're not, they, we're not saying they're contributing to the historic zone. We're saying if there's renovations that have to happen because they're in a the historic zone, you just have to come to the That's a historic zone? According, according to the state and That's the federal. That's crazy. No, no. Crazy, crazy. Okay, I, I, I hear that. I hear that. However, that was what we submitted to them, and this is what they accepted. And they accept, who submitted it then? You guys did? It was submitted in 2019 mm -hmm. after. Who? Yeah. You guys? It was, it was signed by the village of Rhinebeck, yeah. Could, could you sure. show? Could, yes. Clarification. When you say all of Mulberry, I'm thinking you mean up to where it intersects with Platt, not that next section going yeah. down the fairgrounds. All right. It I goes can't. beyond. It goes beyond. I know it does you, go you, all you the way down. See it. Not, so the old district. Hold on. Actually, this is good time. So the old district, the 1979 district, captures. So on Route Nine, um, that. Well, Huck's your mom's house, right? Yes. Um, yes. And that whole property is goes up to here. So this is Mulberry Street. Yeah. And that property goes up to here. Okay. So what the expanded district did is it. I can't see it. I know. Is it closed this line? So okay. it captured everything on Mulberry up to this okay. line, which does include those three houses that Huck just mentioned. That's crazy. But crazy, that's crazy. It doesn't belong to the village. We've been told that. Mulberry? From Platt all the way to the no, fence. No, 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 coming from the fence. From the fence. From the fence. about around, in and around about the, where the fence is. Okay, further up then. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and, and and that's what Huck's talking about. Huck's okay. talking about those houses that are prior to the fence, mm -hmm. right, being included into yeah. that that map. So the village owns the road, is responsible to the road, but we don't own the road all the way through. We have access to the road. You have the road where it turns left. That's what you. That's what the. Well, it's right. really about the fence, Huck. Are yeah. you sure? Yeah. It's not. It's not the. No. 
So you can't really see it, but in, on the um, on the state on the state map, it's in green. So this is the fairgrounds. It's all this green stuff. It's literally just past your property. So I don't know how you can do here. this with a 73 bill modular ranch. It's just crazy. Well, how within the whole crazy. within the boundary, there's going to be many like that. Not like that. Where else? Is, where else? Is so oftentimes, what happens with a historic district is when a large number of the buildings are contributing. Not all of the buildings have to be contributing. That's the point of a district. Instead of in, instead of individually listing, you know, these 63 buildings, they capture the entire district, which includes those 63 buildings, but it might also include a handful of those who don't contribute. I, have, trust me, I do not understand why the decision was made to include that particular part, other than the fact that they wanted to just close the gap from the old from the old map. Um, and make sure that if uh, that large property is ever redeveloped, that it's redeveloped in the style of the Rhinebeck Historic District. Linda? Except to Huck's point, those <coughs> buildings were built in the 70s and the national and state map and, and go up go up to that point in time. So right. they're not they're not contributing in, no. in the state district even. Right. Oh they're not. Okay. Yeah. They're, not. they're in oh. this they're in the district, but they're not right. contributing right. members of the district. There's a there's a whole bunch of buildings inside fun. inside this inside, the, inside the state and, history, and federal district that are non contributing to the district. But it's the overall character of the district is what they were talking about. So once again like the parcel. forest, not the trees. A separate parcel. Sorry, what was that? They're separate parcels, too. Right, so once again, forest, not trees. So think of like a pine forest. It's not all pines, but it's generally thought of as a pine forest. That's what we're dealing with here. Um, we're dealing with the pine forest of the right back historic district. <laughs> so again, though, if someone wanted to tear down that house and build a mega mansion, could they? If it was in one of those houses. Yeah, because yeah, it's not contributing. So once again, the contributing designation focuses on whether or not a building can. It, but it has to be compatible with the. But whatever, the the well, whatever in, in the district, it it will contain it. With it's the grandstands, the fairgrounds. So the point, the fairgrounds aren't in the district. So the point of this whole thing is that once again, to tear down a building is is that's the question, the contributing question. But what it's replaced with. Is is this sort of forest question? It has to be inky. When a maple dies in the pine forest, do we replace it with a maple, or do we replace it with a pine? Or a significant alteration, not just. Or a significant alteration, yeah. Dogwood. <laughs> <laughs> this metaphor is about to lose its power real quick. <laughs> yeah, Joanne. I have a question, and sure. I don't even know if it's relevant to this. Okay. But with thinking about the historic nature, um, I have seen that there's somebody that's bought a number of properties that they rent out, and they have completely black topped everything from every boundary. They have got rid of everything. Is is this going to be continued to be allowed? And I'm not even sure why it was allowed. So um, that's. A zoning issue. Um, that's not a historic issue. Uh, blacktop um, has to be permitted by the building office, um, and no property in the entire village is allowed to be completely covered with blacktop. Yeah, it's like a certain yeah. Percentage 30, of the, the rule is 35 percent of the property has only 35 percent of the property can be covered with impermeables. That doesn't apply to hardscape. At 35 percent. That's building coverage. Right? It's building yeah, coverage? It's building coverage, not asphalt. Right. It's not asphalt? Yeah, correct. Oh, I thought it was asphalt. Yeah, yeah no, it does not. Okay, well, so, in that case, somebody can completely destroy their green space and be done. Well, and that's just a question I have, that if we're looking to preserve a nice historic nature, is there something we want to do to stop people coming in and buying up homes to rent and blacktopping everything? That's a pretty um, permanent thing. So again, I think most of what you're asking is related to the zoning and um, voting to what they would do in front of the planning board. If they're in the historic district, they'd have to come in front of the planning board, present their plans. 
Yeah. Site plan review. Yeah. In includes including hard scaping. Mm -hmm. okay. Does anyone know where that 35% language is? Can you give me a quote section? That. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have it right here? It's in the ball uh, table. Yeah. But that doesn't apply to the asphalt. It does not apply to hardscape. The, it only applies to sorry. It only applies to the buildings and all the buildings on that lot. If you have an and exterior building, uh, detached garage, you know, a pool, a doghouse, I don't know, whatever, you know, the building's on that. You know, I, I don't know about all these hypotheticals. I'm, I'm talking that do we want to do something to right so so more inside this conversation joanne yeah. that is answered by yes by sending that property to the planning board to get a site plan review um so the planning board does have control over landscaping and hardscaping and things like that when it's doing site plan review um in terms of and like the non-historic conversation sure i do think that that's something that we need to consider but that's not part of this conversation okay. yeah Uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> I'm looking at the, uh, the document that the, uh, the gentleman <clears throat> put together, and um, let me be clear, I mean, th these fellows have great expertise, so I'm not being critical, but um, there's a, a passage I'll just read out real loud, uh, out, out, out loud quickly. The resource list may have to be amended in the map developed to illustrate boundary increase carefully drawn to reflect changes. Uh, is there an intent to change the resource list? And the resource list is the 538, however many homes there are, no. uh, properties are. No. Um, <coughs> okay. Because the resource list is the is what we put for is it was in the um, application and it identifies all the buildings in the district and the state and his federal district is either contributing or not contributing. Um, what we would do for um, our district um, by changing that date to 45 is that just gets rid, or it doesn't get rid of, but it just makes all of the buildings, whether or not they're contributing in the his state historic district, if they're younger than 1945, they're just no longer contributing in the village district. But we're not going to redo all well, of it, that it, work. It also says that uh, there's now a belief that there's some properties were entered incorrectly and that some may now be disqualified because they did changes that would no longer make them uh, <laughs> some. I, I'm just wondering, is that, that number, wherever we ended up, and it was um, late 2020, 20, uh, I think late 2020, early 2021, when yeah, and that, that, when, that it was accepted. Right. And, and it was like It was five, admitted to the state in 2019. Um, yeah, that's about right, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so that number, <laughs> that was submitted, which is like 530, 540. Yeah. yeah, that number stays that number. That number stays that number for the state and the federal district. The state and the federal district is not changing. Okay. Right. Yeah, this is we not a conversation not about, yeah, this is not a conversation about creating a new application to send to the state to change the state and the federal district. This is just a conversation about how we want to handle the state and the federal district in Rhinebeck. And I am so sorry, I don't know, my computer keeps flickering on and off. I don't know what's going on. Yes, hi. Uh, hi. I have a uh, quick question about the whole Platt Street thing yeah. and talking about a piece of land where somebody could come in and let's say that part isn't part of the, the historic district. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, well, they could come in. Could they come in and build a big mansion or something or something you mentioned before, glass and steel and whatever. Does want the planning board and the zoning board be, they wouldn't be able to control the size or the materials, some of the materials used on their own. It would have to be. So the zoning code um, limits buildings to 35 feet um, to, and two stories, um, two habitable stories. You can have an attic. Um, and the zoning code also says that the building can't take up more than 35%, that whole conversation we we're just having, 35% of the property on which it sits. Um, that is zoning code regardless of historic district. Um, so yes, the building um, department would not allow a property, would not allow a building to be built that's out of conformity with those, um, unless that person decided that they wanted to be out of conformity with those two requirements and they went to the zoning, the planning board and then the zoning board for a variance, right? Um, 
But if it's not in the historic district, that kind of review only happens at the building office. It only gets to the planning board if there's a problem or if the property owners want to do something out of, out of compliance with the zoning code. Um, if it's in the historic district, it goes to the planning board from the get-go, um, saying we'd like to do this to, our, to the property, and then the planning board says, okay, let's have a conversation about that. So if you accept the date of 45 right. as what's in the historic district yeah. and, and keep the boundaries as the state and federal government has drawn them, yeah. you're going to have big chunks that are non-contributing. Right. But they would still be subject to the demolition permit? No, they would still be subject to planning board review. Right. Because the demolition permit is the 1945 date and the planning board review is this map. So you would still have a variance between the demolition law and the yeah, historic district law in the sense that we wouldn't have any control of whether a building's demolished, but we would have control over what, what would build in its place. Yep. I'm just trying to clarify how that would right. work. Yeah, so right so right now we're currently in the opposite situation where <laughs> so just so you know, there's properties that are contributing in the state and federal districts that are not in control of the planning board. So at the moment we have um, the potential for folks to come to the planning board and ask for a historic demolition permit, um, but then whatever they replace that building with, the planning board has no authority over. Um, so that, in some respects, yeah, it's it's it, it is it's the flip side of the problem. Um, but you're already dealing with that. Like we already have buildings that are not um, contributing inside the existing historic district that you don't have any authority over whether or not they get demolished, but you do have authority over, well, you have scrutiny over what they're replaced with. Um, well, it's just the opposite right now. We, we can, we, if something comes up on Platte Avenue, it's in the National Register, but not in our historic district as itself currently proposed or currently configured. Right. <clears throat> we have control over demolition, but not what gets built in its place. Right. Yeah. And you're proposing the opposite of that, to be able to demolish any building in that non-contributing section. But they still have the planning board to, to make sure that whatever's built in its place would be compatible with the neighborhood, but the neighborhood would be defined by adjacent buildings, not by the historic district in, in the locally recognized historic district on that street. Right. Well, it would be defined by surrounding buildings. Right. I don't know if adjacent is the right word. Yeah. It's surrounding is a term. So Yes. So basically if someone wanted to tear down a 1960s split level and it's surrounded by other 1960s split levels, you would be encouraging them to rebuild a 1960s split level. So the planning board would encourage them to rebuild a 1960s split level. Is, it, is this sort of the concern that you have? Well, I, I think that's a problem, yes. Right. Because most people don't want to... Well, I, I won't say that. There's right. a lot of buildings that come into the village don't want to build one story or story and a half buildings. Well, and that's sort of the problem that we're running into a lot with affordable housing as well, is that people are buying up, you know, small houses and making them big. Um, and so, you know, exacerbating an affordability problem. Um, and especially on properties that can be over an acre, um, you know, that becomes even more of a problem. So the question here, and I think Platt is actually an excellent example of that. Sure, 1960s split level's not the most aesthetically pleasing. Um, however, you know, someone comes in, tears down a house in the middle of that block, and because they can, they replace it with, you know, I say the idea that came in front of the planning board the other week of you know a house that's two and a half stories tall with the gable facing the street instead of one and a half stories tall with the roof line facing the street and then suddenly it's not that much of a bigger building but it looks completely out of integrity with the with the neighbors and if nobody has a has control over that then you know the neighbors are a little bit at a loss of what to do about it um so i hear that i mean I, I think that is a easier, <laughs> my words, 
I think that's an easier problem to hurdle um, because we've already decided that there's nothing post-1945 that's particularly individually significant. Um, what's important in the village, this is so annoying, I'm so sorry. Um, what's important in the village is, or what we think is important in the village, and I'm willing to be swayed otherwise, but is what, a, what sort of like the streetscape looks like. Um, you know, setbacks, general feeling of the piece of property. I mean, I think that you can build a house in the middle of a 19, in the middle of Platte Avenue that's not necessarily a 1960s split level, but that's not out of integrity with its neighbors. So, um, can I ask something? So how would that, would that be, and I'm not sure, so Ju Judy has a little bungalow next to the big black house. So, because I'm getting confused what you need. What? <laughs> the, black, the big black house was flat. not approved by the planning board. This was before the planning board. The, at the moment, the planning board has no authority over Platte Avenue. And so that big black house was, back, this is a great example. That big black house was built without any kind of scrutiny other than is it in compliance with the existing zoning code, which is 35 feet and this setback and 35% and all the rest of it. So if that block had been under the scrutiny of the planning board, I think it would have been very surprising if that black house was built. Right. Okay. We don't have any authority over colors. <laughs> right. It might still have been black. It would be How black, it may have been As long as it's not garish or whatever the language I, is. I just wasn't sure what, what scenario you were talking about that as long as you built something that fit in with the area. So does that mean that if somebody came in and bought the little bungalow next to the black hat house because, <laughs> because it's so close to that architecture, they could do a similar thing? So, so like a streetscape is sort of like the general feeling of a streetscape, right? It's not defined by, it's defined by the collective of the individual buildings. So that big black house, or that black house, is everyone can agree it's an anomaly to the block. So if Judy's house was torn down, if the planning board had control over that particular area, they would say, Try to go with not the big black house because that's the eyesore of the block. Try and go with something else. Try and sort of capture it. I don't, I, I don't want to call Warren out, but he's designed a lot of the buildings in the village. Um, and, you know, I would imagine that he would probably suggest to someone, if that person hired him, you know, what other buildings on the block do you find interesting? <laughs> and maybe we can design something that's like, that looks a little bit more like that. Um, because that's probably what the planning board will go for. Um, so it's never like the one thing that's the outlier. It's sort of what's the rest of it look like. And it's a dance. It's, it's, it's a judgment call. Um, and this is why it's important to have people on the planning board who understand architecture and planning and all of the rest of it. Uh, so and I think the south side of that street is a perfect example of how you want that compatibility with a non-conforming building. Right. So, so if, you, if you make a real narrow district where you exclude four or five of those parcels in a row. That they can all sort of look like black building and the, the skis, chalet, and yeah, the, the whatever and it the, is. The bad part is that we might have some areas like between, flat between Mulberry and Parsonage, and Parsonage which, you know, it's just a round peg and a square hole, but it's nothing's perfect. I mean, we have to come up and with something. Somewhere. We have to allow for some flexibility because we don't want everybody to look like their neighbor either right, right? so you're gonna have it's not pleasant at all. you're gonna have, yeah you're gonna you're, we want to make it so that people can have some input into what they're trying to build right as long as it fits within the character of the surrounding area so right if we that's my argument for keeping the map as we have defined it for the federal and the state because it, in my opinion it puts it into the hands of the planning board sorry but it also puts it in the hands of the planning board thank you if you know what i mean so but it's better to, to not have control over demolition and have control over because 
because we were we were in a bad position of trying to protect the house that we didn't think that was yeah you were you know, worthy of protection necessarily. Yeah, um, and then you had no and then we had no control over what went in his place. Right. Um, right. So it's better that way, but it still seems to me because yeah. there, you know there's the whole south side of the of the village. A lot of those are 30s and 40s houses. Right. And, and we're not concerned about them having incompatible neighbors, but we are for some reason because Platt has big lots. And that seems to me the only distinction between South Parsonage and Platt Avenue is Platt has big lots, so people are afraid of big houses. Um, because somebody could right now go on South Parsonage, tear down a 1930s house, and put up anything they wanted, as long as it fit within the 30%. Right. <clears throat> yeah, that's yeah. It just seems like we're going out of our way to protect, you know, 15 lots on Platt Avenue. Well, um, I mean, out of our way, I mean, like, they're already protected in well, no. some form by the state and the Fed. I mean, it's the not. The Fed is honorific. It's not. Yeah, there's nothing, but, it, but it's there. Like, it, like it, it, the conversation has already happened with those properties, right? Yeah. Like, it, you know, we're not going particularly out of our way. We're just saying, that it's that map. Um, no, I, I, I hear you on that. And it is a bummer that, you know, this conversation hasn't extended to certain parts of south, of the south side of the village, because, you know. Yeah, um, the big section of the south side of the village doesn't even have to come in front of the planning board. No. Yeah, none of it. I, you know, I mean, it's none like crazy. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> why almost everybody they already regulate single family houses. They're distinct, they're protected. Right. They can almost do anything they want as long as it's meets the building. Right. So it just seems um, it doesn't seem consistent, but um, I at least agree that it's better to have us, the planning board, regulate what goes in rather than what goes down because it's not really putting us in at all. That's exactly all how position. I think. Yeah. Well, and I mean, like, even with the current historic yeah. districts, before even 2019, you know, you all had that authority. Um, there are some buildings in the old historic district that are not contributing that you wouldn't have had authority over historic demolition, but you do have authority over what they're replaced with. Yeah. Um, there was that old dust up with the Father Brogan Center of, you know, if it was torn down. You don't have control over that, but you do have control over what is replaced with it. For, what, what would have replaced it? Pre-2019. Well, Pre-2019. <laughs> and that's, I, I would like to delete that section that allows, that whenever we ask for an inventory from the state, by virtue of them having their own criteria, it's like a portal for, you know, those protected properties. Well, they're, they're dumped in without our, our say-so. Well, and that's also, it's, I mean, that's sort of, poorly drafted legislation as well. You shouldn't have anything in your legislation that's automatically triggered by other legislation. Well, um, sometimes, but sometimes. Not, not there. Right. Um, um, so well, I'm going to get back to that. I, yeah, I think they're not going to do it without our permission. Yeah. So you know, at least I, we know about it. This, this was to get a board consensus. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to say, I, I'm going to restate what I said. I think we should keep the state federal maps. I agree. Brand. We have to make a call. I agree. Okay. Great. I agree as well. It's not. It's not perfect. None it's of it's, not, it's not, perfect. It's not crazy either. So yeah. it's not like. We, none, not, and none of it's perfect. Um, but yeah, we have to make a decision, and here we are. Okay. We're good. Does anyone else have anything to say? I'm opposed. <laughs> Mulberry Street, crazy, crazy. <laughs> what criteria are you going to use if we tear down a house? My mother creating a whole problem. That's right. <laughs> if only your mom's property had been smaller. <laughs> yes, sir. I'd just like at some point uh, for the public, if you could clarify with Shippo, if Rhinebeck Historic District homeowners are still eligible for a credit, state tax credit, or whether we have exceeded the state median family income. We may be in an in illegible, ill, ineligible. In, 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 say it one more time. Ineligible. Uh, 
a census district? Um, we are eligible for the, for, the, for the tax credits, both the state and the federal tax credits, until the end of 1920. Wow, until the end of 2024. Oh, so there is no federal yeah. tax credit for homeowners, residential, that I know of. That's all. I'm just. The, I, I did get this historic state tax credit in 2019, and Shippo said, better do it now because you may not be eligible. With the 2020 census, um, from I learned this in the last week or so, with the 2020 census, um, we have now exceeded the income. Yes. And so uh, they are letting us, um, any projects that are started before December 31st of 2024 are eligible. Any projects that are started after December 31st, 2024 are no longer eligible. Can you get that information out? Yes, I'm still trying to figure out how to talk about it in a way that doesn't add confusion, but yes. You said very well, right? Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> Tom Tate. <laughs> <It's not laughs> you go to Panda, very sweetly drafted up a page for the historic district and so we're tinkering with that we I was gonna wait we we're gonna wait to finish it until this question was answered so we we're gonna make sure to include that stuff in it as well John another point I, it would be very helpful yes if somebody took that map of now the approved district and yeah. marked on all of the non-contributing buildings on the map with a cross hatch or some other reason so that the planning board would know Oh. without going through lists what's eligible and non-contributing okay um so a lot of that will be non-contributing it'll still qualify for sort of like the colors that we had from 1979 whatever right. yeah it, okay. you know i tried to do it on that version to the left mark the non-contributing buildings within the, the expansion area right and and there, there are a couple not contributing inside the there, original district there are at least a couple we found that are mistaken mistaken in the National Register nomination Great. that you could correct when you did the historic district map that shows all the non-contributing and the contributing buildings. Sir, we can figure out a way to do that. That's not going to be done tomorrow. I know. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. We have consensus. We have consensus. I think we're going to move on. Fantastic. All right. we thank you have, all. Thank you. We have thank one you piece of much. one time sensitive piece of business oh. that came up today. Okay. Um, we have a Memorial Day parade coming up, and the American Legion Post 429 has asked us as a municipality to be for them to be the sponsor, us to be the host, which allows us to do as we did for the Halloween parade for them the apply for the, um, the permit the permit the DOT permit um, in the essence of time we need to get started on that and this just arrived on my desk today um, but I would like to move forward with doing an application for the DOT permit for the Memorial Day Parade for the American Legion Post 429 so I have a second second any discussion yeah. Can we check oh, with our insurance carrier about that? Yeah, because we're, we're talk just like we did for Halloween parade, we are, okay. we're, we, we meet the standard for the DOT and for our Okay. Yep. So, I make all in favor say aye. 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 Both. Aye. Both. None. All right, I'd like to make a motion to end the meeting. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you all. What a Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.